Okay, let's talk about calcium and phosphorus. I have all this writing on here because I was recording, or I was talking without recording. So here we go. I'm going to just talk about what I wrote. All right, so calcium. When we think about calcium, it's responsible for heart conduction. We think of going back to pharmacology with calcium channel blockers. So if there's an increased workload of the heart, put them on a calcium channel blocker, reduce their blood pressure, reduce the workload on the heart uh, because it's responsible for calcium muscle contraction. Calcium is formed in the parathyroid uh, hormone. Remember that where that is from anatomy in your neck, and there you have four of them, four little wings. I call it the butterfly wings on the side of your thyroid, each side. It's also very important for bone formation. Phosphorus plays a role also. Phosphorus and calcium balance each other out. So when we think calcium, the normal in our blood is 8.6 to 10.2. Two. So if we see a higher calcium, that tells me, hmm, is there something going wrong with the parathyroid since that is regulating it? Uh, why is that happening? Also, if it's too low, I think the same thing. So that's when I go and get some extra labs done, which you don't need to know, but an ionized calcium is one of them to see how much calcium is actually floating around um, in the bloodstream as well as some other ones. Um, that's the normal for that. And with phosphorus, we have a little less phosphorus in our body, but again, it's very important, 2.4 to 4. So how does this play a role with uh, osteoporosis? Remember, that's breakdown of the bone. When I think of kidney disease, remember, kidney disease first can build up. And if the balance is off between the calcium and phosphorus, phosphorus can start pulling calcium out of the bone, really increase the risk of osteoporosis. With hyponatremia, normal values are 135 to 145, so make sure you know that. And we have low sodium and high sodium. What are the causes? Well, there's multiple causes for low sodium and high sodium, uh, but let's just say chronic kidney disease can be a reason. Low sodium can also be, ca be caused by someone drinking in too much free water and not enough sodium, so it just gets pulled out with the water such as athletes and psychiatric patients on certain psych medications that uh, they end up craving water. Um, actually, no, that's this one over here. That's hyponatremia, sorry. Hypernatremia is more like your kidney disease as well as other metabolic uh, disorders. Uh, but how are we going to treat these? So with either one of these, you want to, especially with the uh, low, you're going to restrict fluids, and that would be restrict their water because you want to get the balance, and they're gonna, you're going to give them IV fluids. And a set, same with the high sodium level, you're going to restrict the water. And you're going to give them IV fluids too. Let's just review treatment of low potassium versus high potassium. Low potassium hypokalemia is anything less than 3.5 because remember normal is 3.5 to 5.0 I'm gonna put that right here now how do we treat hyperkalemia a lot of times we'll see hyperkalemia in chronic kidney disease but in diabetic ketoacidosis it's another because remember you need insulin for the glucose to get into the cells and and if you have high potassium that means that you're going to have a fluid shift and so you need, we need to get that hyperkalemia down by shifting the cells. So if we have mild hyperkalemia, we're just going to treat with the uh, potassium sparing diuretics, non-potassium sparing. So that is with your Lasix. So let's see if we can uh, get the fluid shift and move the potassium out. And then we also can treat with K-exalate. K-exalate works in the gut and it brings the potassium down in the blood. Now, if you have moderate to high hyperkalemia, you're going to treat with glucose plus the insulin. And again, we have to remember, you need glucose for the insulin to get into um, the cells. So you're going to give uh, D50 and some regular insulin. Now, this is an ACLS protocol. You don't have to know these. You just have to know that glucose and insulin is a treatment for hyperkalemia, as well as sodium bicarb and albuterol. Again, this helps with the shifting of the potassium the potassium, the sodium, and the glucose. Now, if it's severe, you're going to do um, more, as well as calcium chloride. Well, why do we give calcium chloride? That's because that will help prevent, again, it's that fluid, uh, it's the electrolyte shifting in and out of the cells. And if, we, if the potassium is really high, we want to try to prevent uh, <clears throat> arrhythmias. And so the calcium chloride will help balance that out 
to decrease the risk of going into atrial fibrillation. And why is there high sodium when we have hyperglycemia, high glucose? So here's the cell, and this is the intracellular fluid area. So if you are extremely hyperglycemic and you don't have enough insulin to get in the cell, because remember, glucose and insulin go together. In order to get into the cell, you need both of these. So if we don't have this, glucose cannot get into the cell. And because it works as a diuretic, you have so much glucose out in the extracellular fluid or the bloodstream that it ends up causing dehydration of your sodium. And so basically it's a cell shrinkage and the sodium ends up being drawn out and going up into your bloodstream. So it's all a fine balance. You can have hyponatremia with hyperglycemia also, but many times you'll see hypernatremia because it ends up causing an intracellular dehydration and the fluid balance is off. So it ends up pulling sodium out into the extracellular fluid space. Chronic kidney disease causes mineral and bone disorders because the kidneys do not properly balance the mineral levels in the body. For the first, one thing is they stop activating the calcitriol. The low levels of calcitriol in the body create an imbalance of calcium in the blood. Remember, calcium is made in the parathyroid. Also, the kidneys do not remove the phosphorus in the blood, so phosphorus levels rise. The extra phosphorus then ends up pulling the calcium out of the bones, causing them to weaken. So another factor, though, uh, that contributes to the cause of mineral and bone disorders. When the kidneys are damaged, the parathyroid gland releases parathyroid hormone into the blood to pull the calcium from the bones and raise the blood calcium levels. This response restores the balance of phosphorus and calcium. However, it starves the bones of much needed calcium. For the most part, you're going to see a low calcium in the bloodstream when you have uh, chronic kidney disease and you're gonna have a higher phosphorus level. Other important electrolyte disturbances and kidney failure will be a high magnesium and a high, we talked about high phosphorus, and it would be high sodium as well as high potassium. So as you can see, most of these are elevated except the calcium. You will find a, most of the time on the lower side. So high everything else, low calcium. And remember, a lot of things are going on in the body, but just when you go back and think about kidney disease in general, that's not filtrating properly. So it ends up overproducing or it gets backed up and then ends up in the bloodstream. Getting a lot of fruits and vegetables. They should also be getting green leafy vegetables. They can have juice if they want. They can also have more higher fat foods. I would like you to look up though what a um, renal diet is and especially the phosphorus. Now if the phosphorus is high, that regulates, has, binds with the calcium for bone formation. So make sure you look up how are you going to, or what kind of foods are you going to suggest for this?